Good morning, Wabash. Alejandro was born and raised in Houston, Texas. A brother of VG, proud Glee Clubber, Sphinx Club, and CIBE member. He graduated from Wabash in 2017 as a music composition major. Following graduation, Alejandro returned to Wabash and helped grow and develop the CIBE consulting program with Roland Morin. Alejandro is currently pursuing a dual master of music in choral conducting and voice pedagogy at Butler University and is the conducting fellow for the Indianapolis Symphonic Choir. Please join me in welcoming Alejandro Reina. Good morning, Wabash. Uh, thank you, Gonzo, and the rest of the Sphinx Club for inviting me here today um, to speak to you all today. Um, I'd be lying if I'd said I'd never given thought to what I would uh, have to say if I had the opportunity to give a chapel talk. Um, and I don't say that to be presumptuous, but um, uh, more of like um, if I had something to say that might uh, be relevant um, or something I wish I would have heard as a student. Um, so most of you don't know me. Um, Personally, so let me just provide, uh, provide some insight as to who I am um, and some words to describe myself. Um, I'm pretty contemplative and introspective, uh, sometimes to a fault, uh, meaning I'm a pretty quiet person. Um, I know my roommates um, at 316 would probably disagree. Um, I'm pretty loud when I'm like singing in the shower. Um, but I'm pretty, I would say I'm caring and considerate. I like to make space um, to make sure other people can enjoy themselves. Um, I'm also very distracted and inattentive. Um, literally, this is how far I got into my chapel talk when I had to get up and go do something else and probably, like, I literally picked out this outfit. Um, I like to make people laugh. Um, on another side note, this is how far I got into my chapel talk when my roommate's dog came in my, in my bedroom, which he never does. Um, and I thought, you know, he wanted some pets like most dogs do, but he just needed some carpet to leave some of his droppings on. So, <laughs> thanks. Um, but to this chapel talk, um, it takes a village. Um, it takes a village for you to succeed. It takes a village for you to persevere. Um, I really, I mean, you hear that Wabash, Wabash always fights. You hear that from day one, from when you're being recruited. Um, but it really, immediately after graduating, I really saw what that meant um, from the staff and faculty side. Um, I saw firsthand the amount of money the college puts into your experience. Um, it's a lot, and I didn't see it from every aspect, from the faculty side, I saw it from the CIB, um, from professional development, it's quite a bit. Um, I also saw how much time and effort members of the faculty and spa staff spend discussing the, the question, how can we enhance the student experience? Um, I mentioned that for two reasons, that's one, to remind you that each and every one of you as a student um, and a human, you're cared for here, um, and that's really special. The faculty and staff and deans want what is best for you, even if you think that sometimes that's not it, um, or that doesn't seem like it. Um, and they care for you and then those who are gonna come after you, um, students you'll never meet, um, other Wabash men that um, you know, um, will be here in 10 years, five years, 50 years down the line. Um, and I mentioned that too, um, because to remind you that you're also here to, to really develop um, your knowledge, but also your character um, as a man and just a responsible citizen. So take the time. Um, if you have a semester left here, or three years, or three and a half years, or two years, um, really take the time to consider um, and, and reflect on your, your own character, um, admitting that you know you need some work. That takes courage, but luckily, luckily for you, um, courage is really contagious, and you're surrounded by other courageous leaders. One of the most important lessons I learned here at Wabash um, is that courage not only affects your success, but the success of your direct brothers and everyone else at Wabash. A couple weeks into my freshman year, um, one of my friends was talking about his family, and for one reason or another, um, he mentioned that he had uh, aunts that were lesbian. Um, to him, it might not have seemed like much, you know, he grew up with that, um, but to me, that little tidbit was all I needed to hear. Um, some of the other people in the room were not sure exactly how to react when he said that, but I took notice of his vulnerability, what I saw as his vulnerability. Um, and a couple of weeks later, he ended up being the first person I, really, I came out to as being gay. Um, for those of you that are struggling as students now, um, it takes a lot of courage uh, to take that first huge step, right? Um, but look around you, there are other people um, who have just as much courage um, that have done it. Um, 
and, and remember that you sharing your, your story, if this helps at all, um, you being visible uh, is really a beacon for the next person, for the next Wabash man. Um, that goes to the staff and faculty as well. Um, share your story, please. It is very powerful and it's necessary. And it doesn't just have to be your stories of being LGBTQ+, uh, but being first generation college student, uh, making it through the struggles of mental health um, and, and et cetera. Um, anything that reminds us as students um, and you as students that others have also been through what you're going through and made it through, that's, it's very powerful and it, it'll, it helps every bit. Um, but rather than spend the rest of my talk talking about why it's so import important to be visible, um, go watch Rob Shuck's Chapel Talk um, from, I think it was 2017. Um, he goes into uh, explaining what it means to be an ally, why that's important, and what it, why it's so important to be visible um, as an ally. And again, I don't just mean LGBTQ+, I mean um, in every aspect, um, in all kinds of um, underrepresented minority groups. This next tidbit, this next bit of my Chapel Talk, I really um, wasn't sure if I would include or not. Um, because I know that there are many individuals at the, at the college who are currently tackling this issue, issue, issue from many sides. So please, to those staff, faculty, and students who are tackling this issue, um, I'm not here to discredit your effort, efforts, but to really echo and help make the case that this just can't wait. Um, it's not directed at any one person or office, but something that just needs to be heard uh, by, by those that are gonna listen. And what am I talking about? Um, if the college is gonna continue to recruit more and more students of color, then the college needs to um, reflect that in the faculty and staff so those students feel effectively supported um, in their learning um, as a student, a minority student. And I mean more students who are African American, more, or more faculty and staff who are African American, more Latinx, more biracial, more indigenous, more Latin American, et cetera. Um, that's it's just something, um, and, and I mention this because as a person of color, there are certain experiences that not, that only really other biracial, uh, indigenous, or people of color um, can really connect with. I spent a lot of my time as a student here attributing my mere presence as a student, not because of my high school GPA or my like, extracurriculars um, that probably got me in here, but because of my name um, and, the, and the color of my skin. I really literally walked around thinking that other students might think the same thing about me. Um, and you really feel that, that pressure is really real. I know, I know a lot of students feel that. Um, and you feel like that's a weight you have to carry by yourself um, all the time. Um, this phenomenon is really referred to as like imposter syndrome. Um, and don't get me wrong, you don't need to be um, an ethnic minority to feel this, um, to cite my source. Um, academic psychologist, Dr. Sandy Mann, describes very, various reasons why IS or imposter syndrome is prevalent um, among so many groups, um, among women in the workplace, among men who define their manhood on their ability to fight their battles alone. That's huge, right? Um, I know a lot of us feel that. Um, um, academics and training um, in, in grad schools and in, in, in PhD programs, um, it's felt students of no matter what your background is, um, underrepresented minority groups, and specifically students, um, if you want to learn more about this, um, Dr. Mann's, Dr. Mann's book, um, Why Do I Feel Like an Imposter and How to Understand and Cope with Imposter Syndrome, really provides some several helpful strategies on how to break that cycle of questioning your accomplishments, your worth um, as a person um, who's just trying to, to make it through. Um, and one of the other reasons I felt the need to say this is that Wabash needs more faculty and staff um, that reflect the, the student body um, is because one of my current professors at Butler is first generation and Hispanic. As a student, um, I trust that he has my best in interests in mind and I feel empowered because for the first time as a student of color, I see someone who looks like me doing exactly what I wanna do and that's teach um, and specifically in, in the field of music. I'm not only learning about the mechanics of singing from him, um, but exactly how to make it through the world of academia um, as a person of color, it absolutely makes a difference and it's only week six for me um, at Butler. Again, that's easy, a lot easier said than done. Representation of underrepresented minority groups is not um, an issue unique to just Wabash or higher ed. Um, you see it in K through 12 education. 
look at the representation at local, state, and federal government um, levels of government. Um, look at the private sector. Um, just this morning, I, I had to mention this. I saw uh, a statistic that just like I had to mention. Um, of the f top 500 U.S. companies, there's four um, African American CEOs um, of 500. The top 500. That's four. Um, and when you think of the overall population of the U.S., that doesn't reflect our our population. It doesn't reflect. You know, how do we? How do you know for a fact that they're making decisions um, that are really considering um, those that they don't represent? Um, and it's everywhere. Um, there's still so much work that needs to be done, and it's going to take leaders like you, students, um, to go into your respective careers um, and speak up. Speak up for yourself and demand that the ones who are not at the table are invited to help make the decisions that are going to affect them. That takes courage, and that's what Wabash Fights really truly means. Um, it's fighting for not just yourself, um, or those in your direct circle, but those that you don't see represented in your circle. Um, I'll leave you with this. It's, I just wanted this to be short, but um, it takes an entire village of courageous faculty, staff, and students for you to develop and mature and be successful. The next time you think faculty and staff administration is the enemy, you're probably misleading yourself. Um, the faculty and staff choose to work here, I think, and I saw, and I, and I as, as someone who worked here as a staff member, um, they work here before, because they wholeheartedly agree and support the mission of the college to educate you, to think, um, to lead, um, and to go out and make a difference. Um, and to the administration, the Board of Trustees, and the alumni who have the influence to make some changes, our unstable, our current unstable political and social landscape, because of that, the, the student experience needs action now, and it just can't wait any longer. So. Go vote, um, and thank you, Wabash.